Ruins of Simbaroom is an RPG published by Free League in 2022 and is the D&D 5e version of the game Simbaroom, originally published in Swedish by the company Jadingen and later re-released in English by Free League. I've done a review of the English version of the original game and more recently a review of the player's guide and GM's guide for the 5e version Ruins of Simbaroom. I wanted to make a separate video for the bestiary of this game because I think it does a few things that I haven't seen any other monster manuals do, at least not together all at once. The first little miracle that this book pulls off is that it presents an ecosystem of creatures and NPCs that all thematically fit together. This has been done before plenty of times, obviously, but I'll never tire of seeing a collection of creatures that depict a plausible, cohesive fantasy biome. The second thing that this book does, at least with the non-human creatures, is constantly reinforce that nothing is set in stone and that the bestiary is ultimately yours to do with as you wish. In the setting, the notion is that the human scholars who have recently arrived, as well as the wise ones of the barbarian tribes, really don't have a grip on the origins of any of the creatures or the so-called elder folk, the goblins, trolls, elves, dwarves, and ogres of the setting. Just about every monster entry includes some language like scholars don't agree or most scholars simply think. And if this weren't enough of an invitation to tweak, change, and invent your own monsters for the setting, the last chapter of the book is entirely devoted to being a monster laboratory filled with all the raw components for every possible ruins of Simbaroom 5e statted creature. The third thing this book does is something I'll show you here in a minute. The book is divided into four major sections, the unique beasts, the naturally occurring plants and animals, and the lesser abominations and undead, then the human and elder folk NPC builds, and finally the monster creation guide. I'm going to spend most of this video covering the unique beasts in the first section, and then touch on a few notable points in the later sections. As the story goes, there was once a spider king who led an army of murderous spider folk called Arax. The barbarian tribes of the forest and plains banded together to defeat him, but the Arax still live to this day. Four-eyed with seven jointed limbs, fingers and bodies bristling with black hairs, there are the mere poisoner Arax who serve as the guards and warriors, and they're smart enough to flank their enemies to gain advantage. But then there are the Arak Exalted, who are more grotesque and spider-like than the Poisoners, and wield two legendary actions, including recharging a devious web attack. It's just coincidence that Araks are the first monster listed in the whole book because it's alphabetical, but there almost isn't a more representational enemy that, that you'll face in Davakar. Just these awful, nightmarish things. Bestials are shapeshifters, but sort of brutish and feral. Their natural form is that of a beastly human with sparse fur and hairless tail. What's interesting is that you can play a more sophisticated elven type of shapeshifter called a changeling, and these are of a completely different nature than them. Bestials as enemy NPCs don't change to look like different kinds of people. They change to assume different beastly forms, which in turn give them access to all kinds of different attacks. But that being said, you could play as a bestial if you wanted to, but the book doesn't mention that you can have the change self feet, which is what changelings use to transform their appearance. All you'd have is metamorphosis, which gives you these beastly attack options. They're just not as cool as changelings. Colossi are massive carnivores that look like a mixture of wood and flesh and are born from a mystical ceremony that transform a witch into one of these. The transformation strips away all of the witch's corruption, but also their memories and will leaving behind only a desire to serve the witch that is bound to them during the ritual. If the master witch dies, the Colossus becomes a free agent of sorts and searches for a new master. Corrupted nature refers to an area of the forest that is simply overrun with corruption, and that can be anywhere that the GM decides. This is a pretty important concept in Simbaroon because corruption is supposed to be a prevalent theme, so it's important to include corrupted areas at least on occasion. Fortunately, the corruption can take many forms, so you can always surprise your players. Dense fog, blackened vegetation, the reek of putrefaction, bizarre alterations to the land, gaping chasms in the ground, whatever you want. Upon entering one of these areas, the GM rolls on this table, and there's a possibility of one to five of these effects going into effect. It ranges from merely taking on temporary corruption, to suffering hallucinations, 
to encountering one or more of several different kinds of demons. Darklings are a classic demi-human fantasy race, these sort of ruthless tadpole people who enslave and kill whenever possible. They come in two flavors, CR one half and CR two. That pretty much sums them up. A Death Lord is a sort of revenant that has been resurrected and bound to a sorcerer. It's all good until that sorcerer dies because then the thing becomes a death prince and pursues power at any cost. The worst of them amass followers and servants, and sometimes even armies of goblins and trolls. Since we're talking CRs, these are CR 13 and have a layer action and legendary actions. They mean business. Dragons follow that Simbaroom motif of going through metamorphic life stages. They start as so-called lindworms in their larval stage. They're quote unquote larval, but lindworms are classified as huge dragons with 13 D12 plus 65 hit points, and extreme intelligence, enough to enthrall enemies. But after a time, they fall into a long slumber, just like elves. And when they eventually awaken, they are drachworms, even tougher and deadlier dragons who are hot-tempered and have wings. The next phase of their life cycle is what the authors finally just call a dragon, a gargantuan 245 hit point monster with 26 D6 fire breath, among other things. Actually, my favorite bit about dragons in this game is that the authors suggest a fourth phase in their life cycle, but one that you need to make up for yourself. So they sort of ask you to come up with the biggest, nastiest monster in the game if you want. Edermites are huge insects that swarm you. Honestly, there are a lot of different types of swarming creatures in this game, so don't blame yourself if you start blending them together in your head. One notable feature about Edomites is that they can be collected and used for a couple different kinds of valuable elixirs. Glints are tick-like creatures about the size of a fist that lodge into your throat and take over your brain. Once it's lodged there, you can't eat or drink and you eventually die from that. And the larva in your throat then hatches and feeds on your dead body. There are a couple of interesting things going on here. One, as you can see in this pretty chilling illustration, is that they glow. The second thing is that anyone infected with a glint basically gets an upgrade to their speed, immunities, and hit dice, but also risk taking on levels of exhaustion each day. Guan are burrowers that start small, then grow to tremors-sized monstrosities. Trolls are able to summon these and tame them according to legend. King toads are pretty much what you'd think they might be, giant horrifying toads. They also grow via life stage metamorphosis. I haven't been pointing it out here thus far, but check out right here where it says, some scholars maintain. This is a constant theme with most of the creatures in this book, and I think it's an extremely empowering choice by the authors. In this case, maybe the King Toad develops in stages, maybe it doesn't. It's up to you. I really just appreciate the trust here. Anyway, your older King Toad is going to be classified as a gargantuan beast with an armor class of 18 and 234 hit points on average. It's got a tongue you need to watch out for, and you take 10d4 acid damage if it manages to swallow you. And its leg meat is a delicacy back in Ambria, just FYI. The concept of the mana gall plays with the corruption mechanic in a fun way. These gargoyle-shaped creatures actually feed on corruption from others, which is generally not a bad thing. Except once an adult mana gall has had its fill, a new spawn bursts out of its body and is ravenous for corruption and attacks anything nearby. Also, you don't really want these things sucking corruption out of your body because it's gross and you take piercing damage. Marlets are these huge predatory reptiles that can change their skin color and have a really strong instinct for flanking and surprising attacks. As it's written, marlet hunters are some of the biggest badasses around and have a golden reputation amongst guides and hunters. As far as the stats go, your party could fairly easily take one of these things down if you encountered one. Their uncanny dodge reaction reduces most damage by half, but they're still more of a lower tier challenge. The Neferani are a warrior guard that was bred in the time of Simbarum, which means they're now hundreds or maybe even thousands of years old. I'm not sure how far back the empire of Simbar goes, but it was a long time ago. These warriors don't talk at all, and there are only 27 left in the whole world. Each time they do fight, they usually do so on the side of the barbarians. Anytime any of them fall in battle, the rest of them grow stronger. The way that works specifically is that when one dies, all Neferani who are still alive gain a hit die and their current and max hit points are increased by 1d8 plus 5, and they each increase an attribute by 1. 
This is one of those creatures that really ought to be connected to some storyline rather than serve as a random encounter. There are only 27 of them left, so don't waste them. Another monster that has a lot of fun story potential is the Nightmare, which is a sort of spirit that moves from person to person. When a person is possessed by one, they lead normal lives during the day, but at night, the host is made to go out and do any number of horrible things. The end game for the Nightmare is that the host is either killed or totally corrupted, at which point it leaves the body to find another. Night Swarmers are reminiscent of Tooth Fairies from Hellboy. In this setting, they only exist around places oozing with corruption, so they're really a device to make sure that your players hate corruption and want to avoid it at all costs. A proper swarm of Night Swarmers is called a murder cloud, after all. Really, the most dangerous thing about these creatures is that they can deliver permanent corruption to PCs with their lair action, and that is not nice. Ravenous willows are blood-sucking trees that come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. So basically, they're your requisite killer tree that you can stick anywhere in the forest. Younger such trees have a CR of 14, while the older, meaner version has a CR of 21. So the authors really want you and your players to stop messing around and take killer trees seriously. There are some key features to these creatures that make them scary. The first is that they look like completely normal trees when they remain still. The second is that they can create illusions to bait characters in towards them. And the third is that they get three attacks per turn. Oh, also they can walk around almost as fast as a person. I'm not sure if it's homage to xenomorphs, but Skullbiters definitely give off some alien vibes. They're plate shielded monsters with elongated skulls that lay huge eggs, which hatch whenever warm blooded creatures draw near. They are presented as three types, a hatchling, a crusher, and a queen. These are the kinds of things that you would find in Dark Davakar, or maybe in the depths of the underworld, right after one of the PCs accidentally steps on one of their eggs. The Sly River Hunter is a giant crawfish, except it's translucent in color, so it can really sneak up on you. There aren't really many large bodies of water in the settings map, but as a GM, you can stick a small lake or river anywhere you want, especially in the forest. One of the great beauties of the setting, now that we've brought it up, is that it's largely an unmapped domain, poorly understood by scholars and cartographers. I just have to point out that this is one of the most dramatic action illustrations in any of the three books. You can have a lot of fun with these crawfish. And if you're thinking food when you see these things, check it out. A recipe that uses the claws and tails of the Sly River Hunter. Spites are another overgrown insect that travel and attack in swarms and will implant you with its larva. As with all these insectoid impregnations, it's the effects on the host's mind that are interesting. In the case of a spite infestation, you get the spite sickness, which includes becoming paranoid, confused, and aggressive. You can't recover from exhaustion, and you get the rage feature, which is normally limited to only two class options in the game, and you die after 10 plus 1d6 days when the hatchling bursts from your neck. The World Serpent is the last creature in this section, and it's a particularly special one. Whereas previously we've seen burrowing creatures called Guan, these are really a whole other order of burrowing worm thing. Think of them more like sandworms from Dune, more of a cataclysmic force in the game than a monster that you fight. The name is a little confusing because there's also a so-called World Serpent in the setting that's almost like a mythological demigod, but then you have these actual lesser quote unquote world serpents that are static. There are two kinds that you can run into, a CR-17 tunneler that can cause earthquakes and a CR-26 wallower that does earthquakes and changes the landscape wherever it moves. The beasts and monsters section of the book covers a pretty huge variety of naturally occurring and blight stricken creatures you'll find in the forest. Like I mentioned, I'm not going to go through each of these, but it's a good place to point out the third really great feature of this bestiary. You may have already noticed, but every single creature in this book includes a short description of the creature's tactics in battle. This is a holdover from the original Simbarum bestiary and its inclusion here is really appreciated. Since D&D 5e rules want you to be battling it out so often, it's nice to get these snippets of insight on how a creature might actually wage battle. Another thing worth mentioning about this section is that it really drives home the cohesive feel of the book. You're not getting a huge hodgepodge of all kinds of different monsters that exist on 20 different planes of existence in every imaginable climate. You're getting dark forest creatures that could all conceivably live in the same massive forest. 
And most of the creatures reinforce the nervous intensity of the darkness of the setting as well. One great example of this is the Dragul, who are more or less zombies, but due to the poorly understood darkness that is spreading across the land, anyone who dies, whether they're in the forest or in town, could suddenly rise as a Dragul. This one sentence right here douses the whole setting with a huge dollop of dread and horror. The NPC section feels very thorough, and you'd be hard pressed to find a human or elder folk archetype that isn't covered here. Just browsing through the chapter is enough to spark your imagination for an interesting social encounter at the very least. The final section, Adaption and Expansion, feels extremely generous and is one of the huge features of this book. You're invited to create any kind of monster you want and the authors provide you with virtually all of the components to do so. Categories, features, and traits, of which the traits go on for some pages. All the layer actions, legendary actions, and reactions that they employed in the book, as well as an invitation to think about creature design within the framework of their native environment. And they provide some mechanics for most possible terrains and environments for you to consider. So in the end, I think this is a model bestiary for three main reasons. It's relentlessly faithful to its theme, not just in writing, but in the artwork. All the illustrations are from a single artist who sticks to a very particular aesthetic. Even better, the authors never stop mentioning that the setting is malleable and meant to be hacked and tweaked. They even hand you every last tool in their toolbox for making monsters at the end of the book. And finally, the inclusion of tactics for every creature and the relatively deflated challenge rating is done in the spirit of trying to make combat encounters difficult. Deadliness and danger aren't necessarily the hallmarks of D&D 5e, but it is a beloved feature of the original Simbaroon game. So it was nice of them to stick to their original vision in this respect. Is it a perfect book? Not exactly. I think it could have benefited from fewer of those flavored text pages, which would have reduced the total page count by a considerable margin. The flavor text is really fun to read the first time, but I don't need to lug all that around in the same tome as I use for constant reference. But despite that, this is still one of the very best monster manuals I've ever read. Anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for watching. See ya.